Hi guys, welcome back to the INICT PYQ series episode 2. We will be continuing with the MCQ discussion. I hope you liked episode 1 and if you have not watched, you can definitely watch from the link in the description. So continuing with the discussion, let's get started. So the first question, an elderly woman presents with a chronic history of pain in the small joints of hands with stiffness of the joints in the early hours of the day. The image of the patient's hand is given below. So this is the image and what is the most likely diagnosis? Options are rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, complex regional pain syndrome and vilonodular synovitis. So from the history, it is clear that it is involving small joints and it is having morning stiffness. And if you see the image, it can be clearly seen swan neck deformity and botrinal deformity, which is characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis. So the best answer here is rheumatoid arthritis. Next question, a triad of skin lesions, asymmetric mononeuritis multiplex and eosinophilia is seen in which of the following condition? Cryoglobulinic vasculitis, polyarthritis nodosa, Chuck Strauss syndrome and giant cell arthritis. So if you see the option, cryoglobulinic vasculitis, they are generally associated with palpable purpura and arthralgia, glomerulonephritis. They do not have eosinophilia and mononeuritis multiplex. So the option A is ruled out. Coming to polyarthritis notosa, it is characterized with skin lesions. They also have asymmetric mononeuritis multiplex. But eosinophilia is not a characteristic feature of polyarthritis notosa. So that is ruled out. Coming to option D, giant cell arthritis, they mainly have the cardinal symptom of headache localized to temporal region. They do not have such triad of clinical features. So giant cell arthritis also ruled out. Last option that is the Chuck Strauss syndrome. So that is characterized with skin lesions, asymmetric mononeuritis multiplex and eosinophilia is a characteristic feature of Chuck Strauss syndrome. It is also called eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Hence, Chuck Strauss syndrome is the correct answer here. Next question, A wave in JVP corresponds to right atrial contraction, closure of tricuspid valve, onset of ventricular systole and maximal atrial filling. So if we see the JVP wave, it has A, C, X, B and Y. There are five waves of JVP and it is very easy to remember with the help of the initials only. And if you know what each wave corresponds to, it becomes very easy to answer. So wave A uh, corresponds to atrial contraction, wave C, C for tricuspid valve bulging into the right atrium, wave X, X for relaxation, atrial relaxation, uh, wave V, V for ventricular systole that is the venous feeling, that is the atrial feeling during the ventricular systole and wave Y, Y for emptying, that is emptying of right atrium into right ventricle. So you can remember all these waves with the initials and the corresponding clues. So going back to the question, A wave in JVP corresponds to, so we know A for atrial contraction, so the right atrial contraction is the correct answer. Closure of tricuspid valve, so the tricuspid, the C is for C wave and onset of ventricular systole is for V wave. So we know the answer is option A, that is right atrial contraction. Moving forward, a 16 year old girl who is taking anti-epileptics has had a seizure free period of 6 months. She has no family history of epilepsy, her EEG is now normal and she has normal neurological examination and intelligence. What would be your advice? Option A, stop the treatment and follow up. Option B, gradually taper the drug and stop the treatment. Option C, continue treatment for another 2 years. Option D, continue lifelong treatment with anti-epileptics. So if you see the criteria for withdrawal of anti-epileptics, it includes seizure free period for more than or equal to 2 years, normal CNS examination including intelligence, normal EEG and normal MRI, single seizure type and no family history of epilepsy. So if you see the clinical stem, there is no family history, her EEG is normal, neurological examination with intelligence is normal, but she is having seizure free period of only 6 months and the criteria says it should be more than or equal to 2 years. So definitely we have to continue the treatment for at least two years. Then we can consider gradually tapering the drug and stop the treatment if all these criteria are fulfilled. So the best answer here is option C that is continue treatment for another two years. Next question, Ekin and rifle criteria are used to classify which of the following acute kidney injury, chronic renal failure, acute glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. So Ekin stands for AKI network classification and rifle stands for risk, injury, failure, loss and end stage. So they are both criteria to classify acute kidney injury. Hence the answer here is option A that is acute kidney injury. Next question, which of the following is the most specific marker for alcoholism? Options are ALT, GGT, ALP and LDH. So for alcoholism, both ALT and GGT rise, but GGT is the most specific marker for alcoholism. So the answer here is GGT, which is a direct question. Then the next question, anti-nuclear antibodies 
that is the ANA antibodies are required for diagnosis of which of the following. Options are scleroderma, systemic lupus erythematosus that is SLE, drug induced lupus and Jogren syndrome. Again, this is the very straightforward question and the answer here is SLE where ANA is the most important antibody which is required for a diagnosis. But we should also have an idea regarding the other options and the antibody associated with it. So for scleroderma, it is SCL70. For SLE, there are numerous antibodies among which ANA is the first screening antibody and there are many others like anti-SMIT, anti-DNAs and others. Drug-induced lupus, the important one is anti-histone antibody. ANA can also be positive in both scleroderma and drug-induced lupus. And for Jogrin, anti-Rho and anti-La are important antibodies. Coming to the next question, a three-month-old male child was brought with a history of fever and respiratory distress. Suspecting pneumonia, a chest x-ray was ordered. Which of the following is most likely causative organism? Klebsiella pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumonia, Mycoplasma pneumonia and Staphylococcus aureus. So if you see the chest x-ray with the arrow mark, it is clearly visible a cavity is seen. This cavity is known as pneumatocil and it is a characteristic finding of Staphylococcus aureus. Pneumatocil can also be seen in Klebsiella and Streptococcus, but it is most commonly found in Staphylococcus aureus. So the best answer here is Staphylococcus aureus where such cavities are seen. Coming to the next question, a hypertensive patient is on metaprolol. If verapamil is added, there is a risk of atrial fibrillation, bradycardia with AV block, tachycardia and torsades pointis. So if you see, metoprolol is a beta blocker and verapamil is a calcium channel blocker. Both beta blocker and calcium channel blocker are known to cause bradycardia. So if they are added together, they'll cause more bradycardia, that is bradycardia with AV block. Atrial fibrillation, tachycardia and torsades pointis, they are both tachyarrhythmias and not bradyarrhythmias. So the best answer here is B, that is bradycardia with AV block, when metaprolol and verapamil is both given together. Moving forward, what is the most common pulmonary manifestation of SLE? Shrinking lung syndrome, pleuritis, intraalveolar hemorrhage and interstitial inflammation. So this is a direct question and the answer here is pleuritis which is the most common pulmonary manifestation of SLE. Next question, true about the definition of postural hypotension. Options are decrease in systolic blood pressure 20 mm mercury after 6 minutes of standing, decrease in SBP 20 mm mercury after 3 minutes of standing, decrease in DBP that is diastolic blood pressure 20 mm mercury after 6 minutes of standing and decrease in DBP 20 mm after 3 minutes of standing. So if we see the definition of postural hypertension, it states that there should be a fall or decrease in SBP more than 20 mm mercury and diastolic blood pressure that is DBP more than 10 mm mercury after 3 minutes of standing. So if we go by this definition, options having 6 minutes are automatically ruled out. We are left with option B and D where diastolic blood pressure should have been 10 mm mercury and systolic blood pressure is 20. So the right answer here is option B that is decrease in systolic blood pressure more than 20 after 3 minutes of standing. Coming to the next question, calculate the anion gap from the following values and they have given the values for sodium, potassium, chloride and bicarbonate and they have given the option as follows. So first to answer such question, we should know the formula to calculate anion gap which is very simple. It is sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. So if you just simply put the values in the formula, uh, it is 137 uh, minus 100 plus 15 which gives us the answer of 22, that is option A, which is the correct answer. If you want to quickly revise the acid-base disorders, I have made a complete video on acid-base disorders, uh, different mechanisms of compensation, causes, anion gap, various questions I have discussed. The link to the video you will find in the description or in the i button, you can watch them later. Moving forward, next question, a patient of hemophilia received multiple blood transfusion, which of the following metabolic abnormalities can be seen in a patient? Metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. So we know blood contains uh, anticoagulant that is sodium citrate and uh, the sodium citrate in the transfused blood gets converted to bicarbonate ultimately leading to metabolic alkalosis and each millimole of citrate generally generates around 3 milli equivalent of bicarbonate so about 23 milli equivalent of bicarbonate in each unit of blood. So definitely multiple blood transfusion will lead to a lot of bicarbonate conversions so the most common abnormality which is seen is metabolic alkalosis. So the correct answer is option A. Next question, which of the following is the most common cause of infection post solid organ transplantation in an Indian setting? Options are cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr virus and herpes simplex virus. So this is a very straightforward question and is a very common question asked. And the direct answer here is cytomegalovirus, which is the most common cause of infection post organ transplantation. Moving forward, the last question. ECG of a pregnant lady having preeclampsia is shown below. 
her vitals are stable what is the best step in management of the condition so if you see the ecg it is characteristic of torsadis pointis and drug of choice for torsadis pointis is iv magnesium sulfate so the best step in the management of this condition is option b that is iv magnesium sulfate dc shock and synchronized cardioversion are not required because her vitals are stable and iv calcium is not given in this condition so with this we come to the end of this episode i hope this was useful i'll be coming up with more such set of questions if you are liking this video or if you are liking this series do let me know in the comment section below you can also dm me in my instagram handle if you have any doubts or if you want to reach out for any other queries till then keep revising see you in the next one cheers